Look, it's not sudden at all. This is part of a, a long-standing succession planning process. Uh, this was an appropriate time. Keith has done a fantastic job, as indeed Martin has done. But, but it comes to the point that as we enter a next evolution on the platform that they have put together and developed, that, 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 that a leadership change is, is timely. Keith always said that he would do around five years as CEO. That was in his mind. It was, wasn't a fixed number, but it was a, a kind of reflection in his own mind as to what the appropriate time was. And we're coming up to that period. Um, Keith has been particularly strong in the last three months in, in dealing with all the aspects of, uh, of the COVID-19 crisis and has led the firm through that in an exemplary way. But as we reflected, as we, as we think about the the future post-COVID in terms of the disruption to the industry, in terms of all the changes and challenges that, that we're, going to, we're going to face, and having the opportunity to recruit an absolutely first-rate candidate, um, everything came together in a way that is, I think, very positive for the firm and for our customers. When we hear about long-running succession plans, it uh, gives the indication that there's an internal candidate, but uh, clearly you've been uh, seeking one externally. Why not find talent internally at the business? Was there no one there who could do the job? Uh, we benchmark all our internal people against best in class in the marketplace. We took the, the decision that, that this particular candidate was uh, the best candidate that we could conceivably find. So that's why we chose him. Douglas, I have nothing but respect for Martin. I have nothing but respect for Keith as well. I think they are top rate people and, and great operators. But ultimately, have they failed? And I look at the share price performance since August the 14th, 2017. And of course, we have to be COVID related in this world. But even without COVID, things have been really tough. When I look at the profits uh, down 10% last time around, the net outflows over the last couple of years have been absolutely staggering. Despite my huge respect for Samart Martin and indeed Keith as well, have they ultimately failed in their aspirations in the merger of Standard Life and Aberdeen? No, I don't believe they have. I, I think they were visionary in, in, the circ in identifying the circumstances that made the merger between the two companies essential. And I think both would say that had they not affected uh, the merger, both firms would be in a very different and a more difficult position now. I think it's too soon to say. I mean, I think there were challenges in putting the firms together, which they've dealt with very well. And I think the, the, the merger took place at a, a time of extraordinary change in the industry, the move to passive, the move to private markets, technical uh, disruption, technological disruption, and then adding, adding to that the, the, the COVID period. So there's been quite a, a difficult period to isolate the, the environmental factors from the, 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 the individual factors within the company. But what I can say is they put the two firms together well. They've created a platform for the future, and, and, and time will tell uh, whether the platform that they've put together, which I believe has huge opportunity, and indeed does Stephen, um, is going to deliver what they envisage when, uh, when they put the two firms together. I think we've got a range of expertise, talent within the firm, a geographical footprint, a product set that is, uh, that, that is absolutely first rate. So the challenge now is... Uh, in, in the world we're about to enter, can we, can we galvanize the strengths that we've got, the brand, the technology, the people, and the leadership um, to, to, to deliver for all our stakeholders? And I think we can. Um, so, Douglas, what exactly does uh, Stephen bring to the table? As he left um, City, there were concerns about the underlying performance of the consumer business at City. And just digging back through some of the um, stories, um, he actually got a, an underperformance rating at City on the 2018 financial performance in the proxy statement. Why is he the right person to take over this business now? I think he's got great vision in terms of uh, what the financial services industry will look like in the future. One of the things he did during his tenure at, uh, at, at City was uh, designing programs to address a cultural transformation, putting in strong operations, um, and he uh, led the strategic change for that business within City. In fact, the 2020 proxy statement, which reflects on his 19, 2019 performance, he was the highest rated executive in Citigroup. Um, and, and the point was made that some of the things that had held him back in terms of previous assessments, in terms of financial performances, non-financial ratings were always extraordinarily high. But some of the things that had held him back was investing in the early years before the revenues appeared, which I think is what you should be doing. 
looking at the future, saying, what, are, what, what capabilities, capacity do I need to build for the future? He did that. It came through the P&L in the early years before the revenue, and then in his last year, the evidence began to come through, which is why he was the highest rated city and executive in city in the, in, the, in the 2019 assessment period. So one year later, everything, uh, everything is uh, extraordinarily strong.